Good morning. I'm going to talk about radiation dose in CT today. Uh, some of the topics we discussed in the previous lecture will be followed up here with um, expressing more on the risk estimation and so forth. The topics which I'd like to discuss today is to review back about the CT dose descriptors, followed with the effective dose estimation, and briefly discuss about the uncertainty with risk estimation. In the previous lecture, we saw that how is CT dose measured. In fact, the CT dose is not measured directly on patients. CT dose is measured using standard phantom shown here. The large 32 centimeter diameter uh, water equivalent lucite phantom is called the body phantom. A 16 centimeter diameter uh, lucite phantom called the head, uh, adult head uh, phantom. And physicists use the standard phantom to measure the output of the scanner from which the CTDI and other things are measured. So therefore, the measurement is then used to estimate the patient dose. So the CT dose is measured using only phantoms and nothing directly on the patients. As of now, the main CT dose descriptors are these two. Computed tomography dose index, also indicated as CTDI wall, expressed in milligray and the second important dose descriptor is the dose length product also known as the DLP expressed in milligray centimeter. From there here is the um, summary chart showing what the me what measurements we do on the phantom and what we calculate and from there where we arrive to what is called as the effective dose a risk estimator. In this particular a slide I'm showing here is on the left hand side is the CTDI 100 that is the index number we measure on the phantom using a 100 centimeter 100 millimeter chamber therefore an index as it indicates it is just a measurement in a single slice through this phantom from there we calculated CTDI weighted and then when helical pitch was taken into consideration CTDI wall uh, evolved from if we multiply the CT day wall with the scan length, we arrive at dose length product. So the two dose descriptors CTDI wall and DLP are fixed with respect to the parameter which we select and the um, type of scans we are doing and so forth and the length of the scan. From here, we jump to what is called as effective dose. Why is this important? Because when a patient asks what is my dose? They typically mean what is my risk. They don't want a bunch of numbers. They want to know what is my risk because patients are often worried about this situation, has seen these uh, incidences, are concerned about the radiation risk for a long-term effect. In addition, we are also bombarded with media articles such as these in the front pages of the prominent journals and media, um, newspapers, um, scaring the patients about the uh, CT scans and CT doses. In order to describe this, um, the linking from the radiation output and to the radiation dose to the patient, we arrive at what is called as effective dose estimation. Effective dose is a, is a single dose parameter which basically reflects the risk for a, of a non-uniform exposure in terms of the whole body exposure. What I mean is like um, if a person had a CT of a head or a CT of a chest and we this particular concept allows the risk the patient will have to the whole body because of a CT of a chest or a CT of a head. Basically, it's a, it's a parameter which provides um, a, a risk for a whole body exposure in terms of the whole body exposure. And the other way is like the effective dose concept also provides a way to compare the risk with other type of radiation exposure, whether it's from the nuclear um, cardiology procedure or an interventional procedure or radiation exposure from background radiation. All these things when expressed in effective dose provides a way to compare apple to apple comparison. So the next question is from the phantom measurement, um, multiplied by the length of the scan, how are we estimating the effective dose from CT scans? 
There are multiple methods to do this um, estimation. Here are some of the uh, different methods used for estimating the effective dose. There are computers, computer software which are based on Monte Carlo simulation. There are, there are standard calculators and also there are K factors based on the DLP. I'm going to describe a few of these um, methods used for effective dose estimation. So to, to give us a um, overview of the risk estimation, in this particular gra a slide, what I'm showing here is, um, first we use a phantom to calculate CTDI, which is basically dose in phantom in a single slice. Then we multiply by the length of the scan and take into account a pitch factor if the scan is a helical scan. We arrive at what is called as the DLP. From DLP, we we estimate effective dose. I use the word of estimation because we are not measuring but estimating. So when I say effective dose value for a particular CT scan, I'm very cautious to say it's an effective dose estimation, not effective dose only. So I'm very cautious to say effective dose estimation. Because effective dose estimation, we can arrive in some type of a risk estimation later. The, the computation of effective dose is very complex. For example here, the formulation for effective dose est calculation is we need to take into account all the organs present in the path of the primary exposure region. Let's say for example, chest CT. In the chest CT, one has to account all the organs in the chest field, such as the lungs, the, the, the bones, the heart, and the breast, and each of them we have to multiply each of these organs on uh, dose to each of these organs by a tissue weighting factor. By adding each of these formulation, we arrive at an effective dose for a particular CD procedure. So in summary, the effective dose is basically a product of the tissue weighting factor multiplying by the dose to each of the organ in the, pe in the presence of a particular procedure. The the tissue weighting factor has changed over a period of time. Here is the tissue weighting factor which is, which is currently used based on the ICRP-103. ICRP stands for International Council of Radiation Protection and Measurement. It is an advisory body which examines various research at that particular period and updates these reports on a periodic basis. In the previous ICRP-60, the tissue weighting factor were assigned as follows. The breast had a tissue weighting factor of 0.05, gonads had a tissue weighting factor of 0.2. The current ICRP 103, which is published in 2007, has a different weighting factor. In fact, the breast do tissue weighting factor is now higher than the previous, um, is 0.12, and the gonads are now lower than the previous from 0.20 to 0.08. This impacts the effective dose estimation and that's one of the reasons why physicists like to keep the main dose descriptors in CT to just the CTDI wall and DLP allowing anybody to use the tissue weighting factor of that particular time to arrive at an effective dose estimation. For simplicity purpose also we have what is called as K factors. These were published um, to, to make, give a simplifi simplified version of converting the dose length product which is readily available with each of the patient scan um, to arrive at an effective dose estimation. There are established K factors for um, standard regions such as head, neck, chest, abdomen and pelvic. Uh, these K factors allows um, any user to use the DLP from the scan of a patient multiply uh, this K factor to arrive at an effective dose, which provides a way of intercomparing procedure risk from CT or uh, nuclear medicine or inter interventional radiology or any of the procedure. So for example, in this particular dose report, um, this particular dose report shows a, a patient undergoing a co coronary CT angiography. So on the patient dose chart or dose protocol sheet, shows all the technique factors used for each of the series along with the CTDI wall and DLP. 
So one can use this GLP and and using a conversion factor, a K factor, can arrive at an effective dose value. That's one of the reasons why we try to stay away from giving an effective dose value for each of this procedure at the patient uh, scan time because of the uncertainty and also the, the changes in the tissue weighting factor and so forth. These days, most of the CT scan are done under what is called as tube current modulation. When we do tube current modulation, the, radi the scanner output changes based on the patient size or patient thickness or on the patient heart, heart rate, heartbeat and so forth. So when the, when the scanner, uh, when the CT scan is done with the tube current modulation or automatic exposure content, in that case, the CTDI wall reported at the end of the scan is based on an average tube current used throughout the scan. This is important to remember prior to the utilization of the tube current modulation, the CTDI wall reported was um, same as the technique chosen for the scan. However, with the tube current modulation, the CTDI wall changes for each slice. So at the end of the scan, the, sc the uh, scanners provide an average output. Um, essentially, the CTDI wall at a particular KV and collimation, rotation time and average tube current, all these things are influences the value of the CTDI wall. So how does this help us in terms of some intercomparing from protocol to protocol? In this particular slide showing, the American College of Radiology reference dose levels. As of now, most advanced modalities such as CT, MR or PET CT has to go through some type of accreditation in the US. When they go through accreditation, especially under the American College of Radiology, they do have some guidelines for a accreditation to comply with. Here are the guidelines which basically shows a site's adult head CT protocol should not exceed more than 80 milligray in terms of CTDA wall and the reference level can go up to 75 milligray. These are in fact uh, sometimes also used as a diagnostic reference level. Even though they are not uniformly established diagnostic reference level, this is acting as a starting point for a diagnostic reference level. Shown here are various reference level for adult head, adult abdomen, pediatric head and pediatric abdomen. Um, these are estimation which the site can aim to get their protocol below this le reference level which, which is demonstrated to show good image quality also. Coming back to the risk estimation, the radiation induced cancer risk is one of the concern with radiation exposure. This cancer risk is a long term cancer risk. So in general what we have is the average risk for radiation induced cancer is 5% per sievert. Sievert is a very large quantity of dose. Typically in medical imaging we use in the order of millisievert doses. Millisievert means one thousandth of an order less than the sievert doses. So at the bottom shown here is a conversion factor. 10 millisievert is approximately 1 rem. Um, and one sievert is about 100 rem. On the graph shown here is the attributable lifetime risk per sievert shown across the age at time of exposure. Generally when we say 5% per sievert shown on this graph is male and female being the same attributable lifetime risk across the age, female slightly higher than male because of the breast tissue involved and so forth. But in reality the children are two to three times at a higher risk for the same exposure than adults uh, as shown in this particular graph. So how does the risk estimation um, compares with respect to the dose levels we see in imaging and so forth? There is a lot of large uncertainty in the overall cancer risk estimation. So here is the estimated excess relative risk of mortality among atomic bomb survivor exposed to doses less than 500 millisievert. I just want to show this particular information to put the CT doses in perspective because in this particular data basically shows is um, 
anything higher than 500 millisievert, which was shown, uh, seen in the survivor of Hiroshima and Nagasaki population, uh, survivor population, there were some risk, biological risk estimation, which was significant. However, at anything lower than that, it becomes a lot of uncertainty. As shown in this data, um, the excess relative risk estimation for a variety of dose range in groups shown in millisievert shows um, a large uncertainty in each of them less than 100 millisievert. In fact, the authors goes to explain that anything less than in the, uh, shown in the blue, that is uh, between the group between 5 to 100, in fact, they, they indicate that it is not statistically significant. So why is this important? Because the medical imaging doses range between less than 0 0.1 millisievert to 20 or 30 millisievert per procedure. So if you examine that with respect to the data we have, pretty much there is no significant increase in the cancer risk. But we are in the environment where there is, there is always talks about cancer risk. So when we talk about patients, we need to put this in perspective. On the right hand side of this slide also shown the radiation related cancer risk various model that fits into this particular availing data. As you can see, whatever little data we have for doses less than 100 millisievert, variety of model can be fixed on this particular data. That's where the uncertainty comes uh, into picture. On top of it, the effective dose estimation methodology itself has a lot of uncertainty. From a physics standpoint of view, we know there is variety of uncertainty in each of the steps when we do the measurement. From the measurement we do with on the phantom, the ion chamber we used, and the way we do the measurements, all these things if we compute, at the, num at the end number, the effective dose value we compute itself has a large uncertainty. It can be as high as 40% uh, sometime. Therefore, the overall risk estimation from CT doses has a large cloud of uncertainty. On top of it, the variety of risk models plays into, this re, in, into the realm. There are models called as linear no threshold model, which basically takes into account even a small dose ha indicates to have a risk. And this particular model, LNT, which is now the most accepted model for radiation protection, was developed for protecting the radiation workers, but we also apply for the biological risk estimation for the patient, which has confused the whole thing. There are what is called as the threshold model, and there is also what is called as the hermetic model, which basically tells low radiation dose may be beneficial for the, uh, for the uh, population. Again, put this in perspective for with respect to other type of risk anybody faces on day-to-day -day life, the radiation risk from medical imaging procedures are relatively low or less compared to other risks which we normally see. Therefore, the typical doses for most medical imaging procedures range from less than 0.1 millisievert to 30 millisievert. In this range realm, there are no strong evidence for long-term cancer risk. The uncertainty uh, prevailing with both the estimation and the cancer risk has muddled the discussion on radiation risk. In conclusion, the effective dose uh, provides a way to compare risk with other type of radiation exposure. Even though the effective dose methodology has its own uncertainty and its own um, clouds of uncertainty surrounding, but still, as of now, the effective dose provides a way to compare risk with other type of radiation risk as exposure and so forth. Second, large uncertainty exists in cancer risk at radiation dose levels that are common in medical imaging procedure, um, which is important to understand when we are providing answers to our patients explaining the cancer risk or long-term risk from any of the CT procedures. Overall, uh, overarching principle here is as long as a CT procedure is clinically relevant or clinically appropriate, then the benefits from the CT procedures far outweighs any risk associated.
So, next time, in the next lecture, I want to talk about various CT dose optimizing strategies, which has, in fact, lower or optimize the dose or lower the radiation exposure from CT procedures. These optimization procedure strategies such as tube current modulation, tube voltage selection, iterative reconstruction, and finally the CT dose check and CT dose notification will be discussed in the next lecture. Thank you.